morning, everyone. Welcome to the Cardiology Grand Rounds. Um, thank you all for coming. These are the upcoming, um, upcoming lectures. On the 10th, we have Dr. Heist. I hope I'm saying it right, from um, University of Iowa. And then uh, Virginia Walkman is going to do a PACE presentation on the 17th, um, the 24th. Dr. Cabin is giving us a lecture. <laughs> and, and then uh, Dr. Pfeffer is coming, uh, and that would be very interesting for all the heart failure um, um, uh, folks to come uh, with all the research that Dr. Pfeffer did, uh, did in ACE inhibition and um, aldosterone receptor blocking. Um, and then we have more case conferences after that in November. Today, I'd like to welcome Dr. Naveen Kapoor. He is um, joining us from, uh, from Tufts. He's an uh, associate professor at Tufts. He's kind enough to come and talk to us about cardiogenic shock management. Um, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Kapoor has, has done, um, has contributed a lot to this field. He is, he wears a number of hats at, at Tufts. He's the executive director of the Cardiovascular Center for Research and Innovation. He's also the director of Acute Circulatory Support Program. Um, he's the director of Interventional Research Lab and also the director of Cardio uh, Cardiac Biology Research Center. Um, Dr. Kapoor, after he finished his medical school at Georgetown, um, he went on to do his internal medicine training at Beth Israel um, and then um, did his cardiology fellowship at Johns Hopkins. He stayed there for heart failure fellowship, and then interestingly, he figured that he didn't get enough blood and gory with that and decided to do interventional fellowship. Um, so he's board certified in, in, in both. He's double boarded in both um, interventional and heart failure, which I thought was very fascinating. And, and he, he brings that perspective, and you'll see in his talk how he kind of gets the hemodynamics and the interventional uh, with MCS into, into, into play when we, when we discuss uh, care of um, cardiogenic shock patients. Um, and ten years ago, he went back, uh, went, uh, went back to Massachusetts and joined Tufts, where he started working on uh, device development, mostly MC uh, short-term devices. Um, and then their lab was the first to to show us the role of cardiac unloading and activation of cardioprotective signaling. Um, he also worked on uh, TGF. Beta coreceptin endoglen, its role in, uh, in, in fibrosis, and, um, and he's currently working on suppressing the endoglen and, and, uh, and has NIH grants to see if that would help survival in both right and left sided heart failure. Um, he's also the national PI of some of the pivotal trials that, that we talk about when we talk about um, uh, shock management. He's, he's the national PI for the door to um, door to unload trial and shield two trials. Um, and um, with that, I invite Dr. Kapoor to, to share his thoughts on management of cardiogenic shock. Objecting? Okay, great. Great. Thanks very much for that invitation and for the introduction. Um, so, I'm going to be talking to you today about acute mechanical circulatory support and this field that's been emerging and growing in its role in cardiogenic shock and contemporary approaches to cardiogenic shock. So back when I was finishing up fellowship in 2006, 2007, uh, we were basically at the brink of a launch in a field of mechanical support. And back then, from an interventionalist perspective, this is what an LVAD looked like. These are the Thoratec IVADs, which were filled to empty mode pumps that essentially uh, were as close as we could get in the cath lab to a mechanical circulatory support device. Since then, there's been a lot of innovation in the field. We've seen these uh, pulsatile devices go on to continuous flow devices. This is the hardware HVAD in the middle. And then these have now become miniaturized and put on a stick, and these are now the impella devices. These are your microaxial flow catheters, which are delivered percutaneously. So just over the past 10 years, the amount of mechanical engineering and innovation in this field has grown immensely. And I think the next 10 years will be just as exciting uh, based on what we're seeing coming out. Now, how we use these devices has also grown quite a bit. So we used to use these for mostly, these percutaneous devices, mostly for high-risk intervention. 
This has now become a very central focus of our shock program. And in fact, we've become quite creative now. We used to do balloon pump, impella, tandem, anything we could do to support both ventricles. And then ultimately this became two impellas, and now this is our more common platform, which is the bipella configuration using a microaxial flow pump for the left and one for the right. The other thing that we're very excited about, especially in the heart failure arena, is the possibility of using these devices to bridge patients to recovery. So this is a patient who was bedridden about three days prior to receiving a microaxial flow pump that was deployed through the axillary artery, and now he's sitting up and he's exercising. So if you're a VAD surgeon and you're walking by a patient's room in the CCU and you see a patient lying pale, gray, making no urine, flat on their back, versus sitting up, riding a bicycle, talking to you, and it turns out that they're on a percutaneous VAD, you're more inclined to take that patient to surgery, give them better options as an exit strategy. So this is sort of another uh, area that's coming down the pike. So for the focus on cardiogenic shock, if you manage shock in 2017, my opinion is, is that you should be an acute MCS specialist. And the reason I say this is that in most traditional shock programs, for patients who come in, whether it's AMI shock or advanced heart failure shock, they come in through all sorts of portals into the hospital. And when they engage with the quote unquote shock team, usually then there's a discussion about drugs, diagnosis, and there's usually delay that gets bundled into that conversation because you have to have several conversations at each of those levels in order to ultimately get that patient towards stabilization. And usually that means getting the patient on mechanical support. Whereas our approach has been a little bit different. Instead of designing a shock team, we've actually now focused on developing an acute MCS team. So that team gets activated not because everyone has got a blood pressure less than 90 or because someone has a diagnosis of possible shock. It's usually activated as a simple question of, should we be putting this patient on acute mechanical support or not? And so the members of that team, the decision-making team, are primarily folks who are going to decide, do you need a device or do you not need a device to manage this patient? And that focuses the question and it helps expedite the conversation. And so the AMCS specialist can be an interventionalist, it can be a surgeon, it can be an advanced heart failure person, it can be a critical care uh, intensivist, and usually it's one of, the, one of each of these people who actually joins in the conversation to make that decision. And the reason why this becomes important is because when you think about cardiogenic shock in its earliest form, it's a hemodynamic embarrassment to the heart that's now led to uh, low perfusion systemically. But the longer you stay in cardiogenic shock, this hemodynamic problem becomes a hemometabolic problem. And if you have a hemodynamic problem and if you have a hemodynamic support device, you generally have a solution that's one-to-one, -one, and that'll allow you get to get to recovery if you can get to these patients early enough. But by the time you get to hemometabolic shock, these patients now need multi-organ replacement. They need dialysis, they need ventilators, they need mechanical support, and at that point, you're starting to get to the point of no recovery, and you're starting to get towards futility. So time is a critical element that we'll be hitting on during the talk about how long you're going to spend in cardiogenic shock. And that's why setting up the shock team has to be in a way that expedites decision making around getting hemodynamic support for patients so that you can recover them. So these are the spectrum of acute MCS devices in 2017. So everyone's commonly aware of the intraortic balloon pump, which is pulsatile. And just like the surgical VAD arena, this has now gone from pulsatile to continuous flow pumps. Of the continuous flow pumps, there are axial flow and centrifugal flow types of devices, which is more related to the pump itself. Of the axial flow pumps, this means that blood comes in one direction, comes out another direction, all in line with the motor. The impella platform is the most common that you're going to hear about. The one that's emerging is coming from Thoratec, now St. Jude, now Abbott, but that's the HeartMate PHP or percutaneous heart pump, and we'll show you a little bit about that. The centrifugal flow pumps sit outside the body. So they take blood from the body and they displace it somewhere else in the body. And the common ones to be aware of are the tandem heart device, which is a left atrial to femoral artery bypass pump, or venoarterial ECMO, which is simply taking venous blood, displacing it into the arterial system after oxygenating it. For the right ventricle, this is another area that's growing quite a bit. There are devices specifically designed for right ventricular support. The Impella RP, again, is probably the most common one that you're going to be hearing about. And this is a microaxial flow catheter. It takes blood from the RA, puts it into the PA. And then there are, again, centrifugal flow pumps, VA ECMO, the tandem right-sided device, and then something called the Protec Duo cannula, which goes in through the neck and simply takes blood from the RA to PA once again. Now, one of the major issues in this field of acute mechanical support is that we've demonstrated hemodynamic efficacy, but we haven't demonstrated clear clinical benefit in, small, in uh, randomized controlled trials.
And that's a major problem for the field because designing randomized controlled trials in cardiogenic shock is a major undertaking. And part of the reason why we're here today having this conversation is that people have yet to sort out what is the ultimate shock algorithm. And the innovation from the engineers is going so fast that the education hasn't caught up with just understanding how these devices work, when to apply them, and in what situation. So this is where we know the devices work hemodynamically, but we don't know how to use these tools that we've been handed. So one of the things that we'll also be hitting on is the concept of ventricular unloading. And I think this is a fundamental target of therapy when we're thinking about acute mechanical support. So just like your surgical VADs, the purpose of a VAD is to overtake the function of the native heart and allow the heart to rest while the pump does all the work. And when we think about hemodynamics and the impact of these devices, we break this down into the pressure volume loop, which helps us understand the energetics with each cardiac cycle. So this is one pressure volume loop representing one cardiac cycle. The area inside the loop is stroke work, and the area that's circumscribed between the uh, slope of contractility and the slope of relaxation is the area known as the pressure volume area. And the pressure volume area correlates directly with myocardial oxygen consumption, and that's an important point that we'll come back to at the end. And when we think about how much oxygen the heart consumes and where it's using that oxygen, the majority of that oxygen is actually being used for mechanical work. So if you can replace the mechanical workload of the heart, you could substantially reduce the amount of oxygen consumption. And if your heart is ischemic, that also may be very beneficial, especially when you're thinking about how to apply these devices. And then the longer the devices stay in place, then there are alterations with calcium cycling as well as basal metabolism, which we'll show you a little bit as well. So when a device goes in, the ultimate signature that you should be seeing is a reduction in LV pressure and LV volume to reduce that PVA and ultimately lead to reduction in myocardial oxygen consumption. Uh, when this patient is in cardiogenic shock. So we've been studying these devices for some time. These are all various pressure volume loops generated in patients uh, or in preclinical models. This is the intraatic balloon pump, which drops pressure but doesn't drop volume very effectively. This is VA ECMO, which contrary to what many may think, actually drives up ventricular pressure and doesn't affect volume. And we'll talk more in detail about VA ECMO. And with the tandem heart device, that left atrial sourcing centrifugal flow pump, it reduces preload very well by reducing volume, but doesn't have that much impact on pressure. And it wasn't until we started working with the microaxial flow pumps that are put across the aortic valve, transvalvular pumps, that we saw a reduction in both pressure and volume and started to get towards that reduction in pressure volume area that we ultimately needed to see. And the reason we did all this work with these pressure volume loops is that the companies hadn't done any of this work. And in fact, if you ask the company, can you show me your pressure volume loops, the answer in 2007 was, I'm sure we have it somewhere. And so now that we, we decided to do it on our own, we've not begun to understand how these devices work. This allows us to really become creative with our application in the clinical environment. So a few words just to understand, again, the clinical principles of how these devices work. So if you remember to Kantrowitz and the esteemed colleagues back in the 1950s who launched intraatic balloon pump, they built it on the fundamental principle of counterpulsation. And it's important to remember that counterpulsation requires native LV pulsation. These devices, when they were first introduced, were designed to enhance coronary blood flow. And the issue in cardiogenic shock is that if you don't have uh, native LV pulsation and your stroke volume goes from 70 down to 20 and you're injecting 20 cc's into the aortic root, there's not that much to counterpulse against. And this study from Susie Joseph uh, and the group at University of Washington in St. Louis demonstrated this very effectively where they showed that if you had a low RV cardiac power or low LV cardiac power, which is essentially how much uh, function your native ventricles have, then you would have more likely to have these patients decompensate on a balloon pump. Whereas if you had intact ventricular function, your balloon pump may actually stabilize your clinical condition. So the take home message for counterpulsation is that the more dysfunctional the ventricle, the less functional a balloon pump becomes because it depends on that native counterpulsation. So this is in contrast to all of the rotary flow pumps that we showed you, where actually they operate on something known as the HQ curve. And the way this curve works is that device flow is directly related to RPMs, which you dial up and down, and is inversely related to a pressure gradient across the aortic valve. And so, for example, if a patient comes in with a normal blood pressure and you put in a transvalvular pump, you should expect, because the gradient across the aortic valve and diastole is about 75 millimeters of mercury, you'll expect flow of about 1, 1.5 liters per minute. You start working on the patient, put a left lane balloon in, you're occluding flow, you're creating acute ischemia, 
and the patient starts to become hypotensive typically, this is when your delta P in the denominator starts to become smaller, and so flow starts to go up, and now you're up around 3.5. And if your patient comes in in cardiogenic shock with the smallest delta P across the aortic valve, pressure of 70 over 50 and 70 over 20 in the LV, then you're going to have the highest level of flow. So each device has its own HQ curve. This is a representation. But what it tells you is that the more dysfunctional the ventricle, the more functional a continuous flow pump becomes. And that's why you're seeing this shift from intraortic balloon pump to now all of the continuous flow technologies because of the way they work, especially in the cardiogenic shock patient where you don't have native pulsation to work against. So this was our pressure volume loop that we did early on with the Impella platform. And this is the one that changed our entire shock program from a tandem heart balloon pump program and switched us over to an Impella ECMO program for the most part. And what you see here is the pressure volume loop when we activate the Impella across the aortic valve shrink and you see a reduction in the, in the volume as well as a reduction in pressure. But most importantly what you see is that the pressure volume loop now looks like a triangle. And normally the pressure volume loop looks like a square. And the reason why that's important is that during those isovolumic periods of contraction and relaxation, that's when the most amount of energy is utilized by the myocardium. And so by taking this triangle or the square and putting it into a triangle, you've now reduced the amount of mechanical work that the heart is doing. And that's that sine qua non when you see the triangular shape to the pressure volume loop, especially if that's correlated with a sustained mean arterial pressure. So typically what we see in the cath lab is we see you have a transvalvular pump off, you have a transvalvular pump on. And this is a Langston catheter that measures LV and aortic pressure simultaneously. And when you have the pump on, especially if someone has a severely dysfunctional ventricle, the flow goes to laminar flow. The aortic valve, for the most part, is closed. And this transmyocardial perfusion gradient, which is driven by LVDP and aortic diastolic pressure at its simplest form, starts to increase substantially as you reduce LVEDP and increase mean arterial pressure in the aorta. So one of the troubleshooting tips with the Impella platforms, however, has been hemolysis, especially in cardiogenic shock. And so this equation just looks at the blood damage index. This is another paper we have coming out. And basically, the primary determinants of hemolysis have to do with the RPMs, or the speed that you put into the pump, as well as the scalar stress along the uh, blades themselves. So there are multiple, and engineers go nuts on trying to figure out what's the ultimate blade design that would reduce scalar stress to improve the hemolysis propensity, especially when you're shrinking these pumps down to the size of a pencil and trying to put them into a patient and not cause shear. So one of the things that we've been studying is looking at hemolysis markers. I think it's an important thing. All patients who get an Impella get LDH and plasma-free hemoglobin Q12 hours for 72 hours. That's now part of the standard order set. And the reason that we do this is that LDH for many of the shock patients that are coming in are already massively elevated because they're coming from the liver, they're coming from the heart, skeletal muscle, et cetera. So we can't use LDH to determine hemolysis. It has to be a plasma-free hemoglobin. And so now the point-of-care test for plasma-free hemoglobin is what we use. And this is where you can identify the patients who might be experiencing that stress of hemolysis from the device itself. So one way to obviate that is to make a bigger pump. The problem is the engineering uh, uh, challenge is trying to put that onto a small French access site so it can be delivered across the aortic valve. So this is the HeartMate PHP device, and this is the one that's being used in the SHIELD-2 trial. It's a 9 French catheter. It goes through a um, 13 French or 14 French sheath. And when it sits across the aortic valve and you put it into the LV, what you end up doing is you deploy a 24 French impeller. And this is a self-expanding impeller that gets put across the aortic valve. And the highest flow we've seen ranges anywhere between 4 to 6 liters per minute anecdotally. Uh, and this, now, this device is now being studied in high-risk PCI. This was the SHIELD-1 study that was presented in 2015. And now we're doing the SHIELD-2 study, comparing the PHP to the Impella device for patients coming in uh, for high-risk PCI. But by making the impellers bigger, now you can potentially reduce the amount of RPMs required, reduce that scalar stress, and potentially reduce hemolysis. And this device works on a very different operating HQ curve uh, than the Impella platform as well. So what about ECMO? So that's the other one that we use quite a bit. And so ECMO takes blood from the venous system, oxygenates it, puts it into the arterial system, so you're pressurizing the arterial system by displacing venous blood from a reservoir into and oxygenating it. So the pressure volume loop starts to do something very different. So now you see we started here. The LV pressure points start to rise up, and the volume points haven't really changed very much. So when you look at this sort of pressure volume loop at the end, you're not seeing 
a triangular shape, what you're now seeing is a square go into a rectangle. And this rectangle in particular has a very high LV systolic pressure. So now when you're thinking about unloading, we're supposed to be reducing pressure and volume, this device will very effectively increase your blood pressure. And for us on the operating side and clinically, that's a great thing when you've got someone in cardiac arrest, when you've got someone with VT or VF that's recurrent, or when you've got someone who's got complete circulatory collapse due to multi-organ failure, you need to get the blood pressure up. And that's why we use VA ECMO commonly for those types of scenarios. But if our ultimate goal is to reduce the amount of workload that the heart is doing, then this is where it becomes a challenge. And you have to now decide in that AMCS conversation is, what is the ultimate objective and exit strategy for this patient? And why are we using VA ECMO as opposed to LV unloading? So these are the pressure volume loops that we designed. I won't get into the um, discussion about arterial elastance. That starts to get past the point. But the PVA, as illustrated in the shaded boxes, actually goes up once you're on VA ECMO. And so that's why when we want to test this in the cath lab, we again pull out our friend the Langston. And the Langston shows LV pressure in yellow, aortic pressure in purple. And when you activate VA ECMO in a shock patient who comes in at 60, this is what you see. And if you're just looking at the purple tracing, you may be reassured because you're going to see an increase in your mean arterial pressure. You're going to see a narrowing of the pulse pressure. So you might think the aortic valve is closed. And the reason why the aortic valve is closed in this case is not because you've unloaded the left ventricle. It's because you've pressurized the aorta. And so the pulse pressure coming out of the native LV is smaller. But the LV pressure has now almost doubled at this point. And so this is where you start to see white out of the lungs, congestion. So you have to always watch for that when you're launching someone on VA ECMO. So this is why we use vent mechanisms. A few minutes later, there's minimal pulsatility in their arterial tracing, but the LV pressure is still up. And so we activate a balloon pump, for example, and now you see the yellow points are coming down. So you're unloading the left ventricle at that point, and you're still now getting that pulsatile. That counterpulsation is actually augmented because you've pressurized the aorta in which the balloon pump is working. So with VA ECMO, about 85% of our patients are vented. And there's been a culture shift in VA ECMO use. The use of VA ECMO has gone up astronomically over the past five years alone to almost about 8,000 implants per year in the United States. We're also seeing this as primarily being driven by a shift from surgical implant of VA ECMO to medical implant. And this is data from ELSO, basically showing the growing use of uh, VA ECMO for diagnoses that, have, uh, that are less related to the operating room and more related to the medical ICUs and the CCUs, et cetera. But one of the interesting studies that came out this summer in 2017 was looking at VA ECMO in the advanced heart failure population. And when we think about the ultimate outcomes for these patients, we're either trying to bridge them to recovery or bridge them to their next advanced therapy, heart transplant, or LVAD. And this study that came out looked at 105 patients where VA ECMO was used for advanced heart failure patients. The patient, 32 of them got switched to either centrifugal pumps or LVAD or a transplant, and these patients did relatively well over a period of time. But the 73 patients who did not get switched to the next therapy, 98% of them uh, died if they didn't get a VAD or transplant. And so what this tells us is that VA ECMO is a great bridge if you've got a candidate who can be bridged to next advanced therapies. But as a recovery mechanism, it's a challenge, especially in cardiogenic shock or advanced heart failure patients, because the ventricle is still working uh, to ultimately uh, basically sustain native function. So despite a huge growth in ECMO, and this is, these are the numbers from 2012, which have now gone up even further, we're seeing that there hasn't been any change in survival alone. And I think that's been a big challenge with VA ECMO, is how do you optimize ECMO utilization to improve survival outcomes? So for the troubleshooting tip for VA ECMO is, of course, now you're doing large bore cannulation, especially if you're doing it percutaneously. And this is an example of a typical VA ECMO patient that comes into our cath lab. And this is why the interventionalists have now taken over the VA ECMO program. So our VA ECMO, about 90% are implanted by our STEMI team. So all the interventionalists do ECMO, all of them do Impella. The decision is made as to what support system to go on to, and it's done in the cath lab. And it's done with integrated perfusion, uh, which means these little green dots are perfusing both legs bilaterally in this case. It's also done with the venous cannula here and the arterial cannula here. On this side, we've got our swan in, which is a mandate for anybody in shock. And then we've also got, basically, we had to add and impella into this patient because the LV was distending and we were starting to get white out. So the story for this very briefly was this is a 14-year-old, and I don't typically do 14-year-olds, but this was a PICU call, uh, code blue overhead, and this was a patient who was coding in the PICU, 14-year-old who had come in with myocarditis and needed uh, bedside implantation of ECMO. 
So we implanted ECMO at the bedside. We then brought this patient to the cath lab, and then that's where we did the anti-grade perfusion on the uh, left side. But when we were there, we also dropped a Langston into the LV and saw that the LV EDP had gone from about 20 up to about 50. We were getting white out and frothing through the ET tube. And so this is when we put in an LV vent, like the Impella, which is a small kid to be putting a 14 French in. So then we had to anti-grade perfuse the Impella side as well. And so now from the arterial cannula, which has oxygenated blood, we'll have a splice go over to the perfusion side on the Impella site, and we'll have a splice go over to this side. So you're doing bifemoral bypass while having VA ECMO and event put in place. The good news is that this kid, and this is, the, this is one thing we haven't figured out how to put into a bottle, has age on her side. And she walked out of the hospital two weeks later yelling at her mom while holding a Frappuccino. So neurologically intact, which is our ultimate goal. But the reason we also do about 90% perfusion antegrade is that limb ischemia and amputation is a major uh, cause of morbidity and mortality after VA ECMO. So this is why, again, the cath lab has sort of taken over a lot of the VA ECMO uh, percutaneous implant because we can do a lot of those techniques um, under fluoroscopic or ultrasound guidance. So when we think about how to apply all these technologies that you just heard about, this robust engineering platform that's been handed to us, it's been, uh, it's been an interesting past few years because people use a lot of different terms. They say, I'm going to put someone on circulatory support, cardiac support, or ventricular support, perfusion support. So we've broken this down into a fundamental hemodynamic support equation, which hits on all the four major objectives that you're trying to achieve when you have someone in cardiogenic shock and you're putting in an acute MCS device. The first is to raise mean arterial pressure by giving them circulatory support. The second is to provide ventricular support by unloading the left ventricle, which we talked about. The third is to enhance coronary perfusion, especially in the ischemic setting. And the fourth is a new one that we're beginning to become very interested in, which is the concept of renal and hepatic unloading for these patients, especially as they transition from hemodynamic to hemometabolic shock, uh, which are now is that ultimate platform of looking at time. So if you look at the studies that have come out recently, there's the IMPRESS trial, which came out one year ago, which looked at balloon pump and impella in patients with cardiogenic shock. And these patients, if you look at the inclusion criteria, were primarily in hemometabolic shock at that point of futility with lactates of 10 plus, cardiac arrest, out of hospital, ventilated on dialysis. If you look at the other study that's coming out, which is the Detroit Shock Initiative, this is trying to get pumps in early in the stages of STEMI shock, and this is trying to get onto this side of the equation, which is hemodynamic support, when it's a hemodynamic problem to recover patients. So when you think about the objectives and are we achieving them with each of these platform, if you use Impella in tandem, you'll get the circulatory support, you'll get that pressure volume loop to shrink, and you'll get that enhanced transmyocardial perfusion gradient. For VA ECMO, you will very effectively get circulatory support, which is an emergent situation. That's actually the primary priority. But you won't get that ventricular unloading. And coronary perfusion really depends on what your EDP is at the time. But if you put VA ECMO with an LV vent, where you're unloading the ventricle and sustaining mean arterial pressure, you can achieve, again, all those three green check boxes for circulatory, ventricular, and coronary support. The renal and hepatic, I always put as a question, because we don't have enough science in the field. So for all the cardiorenal, cardiohepatic folks out there, that's another big area of investigation that's starting to become more in vogue. So I'll leave you with four messages on the mechanical support uh, used for cardiogenic shock and how we can improve. And we also at Tufts are still working on improving on each of these messages as well. So the first one is that we don't use hemodynamic data to decide to, to use uh, decision making often enough. And so there are a number of hemodynamic formulas that are out there that we now start to employ in our shock algorithms to figure out what is our next step. The first one is the cardiac power output. This was put out by Scott Finke and Judy Hockman way back in 2004. But this study and analysis of the shock trial demonstrated that the magic number is around 0.5. And if you start to have patients who have a lower cardiac power output, in-hospital mortality starts to climb. So the first thing we're looking at is what is our cardiac power output for patients who come in with shock on medical therapy? And then what's the effect of the intervention? So if we put someone on a tandem, on an impel on the left side, and we're getting better, but we're still not making urine yet, and we need to put something on the right side, now we're getting up to that range where cardiac power output has really started to improve into the survival zone. So the use of the PA catheter, I think, is a really important point when it comes to shock. The ESCAPE trial, uh, I think, provided some information about PA catheter use, but also did a lot of damage to cardiovascular medicine, primarily because those were not patients in cardiac, cardiogenic shock or cardiac units. 
So there's now more emerging data re-emphasizing the point that if you're going to use hemodynamic support for shock, you've got to have hemodynamic data, and that comes from a PA catheter. So this is a fundamental part of the shock algorithm is early use of a PA catheter. This also becomes important because this paper from Joe Rogers and the group at Duke demonstrated that in patients with advanced heart failure and shock, it turns out that when you try to look at uh, predictors of uh, morbidity or mortality after uh, coming in with shock, that it's not just your cardiac index. So the magnitude of the cardiac index drop is not the primary determinant by itself, but actually it's your congestive state. So if your RA pressure is elevated and your wedge pressure is elevated, those are actually two of the primary determinants of outcomes. And so the congestive state, I think, is another marker of that transition from hemodynamic to hemometabolic shock, because as you know, if you start to develop nephrosarca because of a large CVP and the kidney can't get rid of that fluid, then you're starting to get renal failure, and that's when the hemometabolic cascade starts to spiral. So we've started to look at this from the heart failure lens in the cath lab, and have started to create a two-by-two -two table which you're all very familiar with Anginoria's work, looking at warm and wet and cold and dry, et cetera, for heart failure. But the question is, what about the hemodynamic profile and shock? So if everybody comes in with a low cardiac index, what if you stratified patients by their wedge pressure and their right atrial pressure? Could you start to define shock profiles where you say this patient has LV dominant congestion, biventricular congestion, or RV congestion, all in the setting of cardiogenic shock? And so this is the scatter plot that we started looking at at all of our patients um, in the uh, Tufts program. So this is our analysis from last year. This has now been updated. But this is what we saw. Uh, each of these patients received either Impella or VA ECMO for cardiogenic shock. When you stratify them by wedge pressure or RA pressure, the majority of the patients are falling in the upper right quadrant where they have biventricular congestion. And so putting in a pump on the left side may or may not solve that problem. Putting in a pump on the right side may not do it. Putting in both pumps, is that the right answer? Now you're talking about even more uh, invasive maneuvering for these patients. And so when we look at the outcome of these patients, and we look at LV and RV uh, patients, we were finding that the majority of these patients do better if you use a univentricular support strategy targeting the dysfunctional ventricle. Whereas the BIV cases, no matter what you did, they still had poor outcomes, mortality of about 50%, and the majority of the patients fell into the BIV congestion group. So is that because we're getting to them too late? Kidneys have shut down, RA pressure is going up, they're refractory to anything in terms of decongestive therapies. This is something that still remains to be determined. And when we look closer at the BIV groups and our utilization of these pumps, we found that about 60% of them were just getting left-sided support, even though they had biventricular failure. And it wasn't until we started using two configurations to support left and right that we started to see a dial in the right direction with a reduction in in-hospital mortality. So BIV congestion is common, univentricular support for univentricular failure, and the question that remains open is biventricular support for biventricular failure. Is that the right uh, way to go? The other thing that we've been working on for some time now is the hemodynamic formulas to assess right ventricular function. So this is our paper that came out in circulation last month, and this is a summary of all of the hemodynamic formulas that people have proposed to look at right ventricular function and determine whether or not the RV has failed or not. And the most common ones are your RA wedge pressure ratio, your pulmonary artery pulsatility index, which is PA pulse pressure divided by RA pressure, and then, of course, RV stroke work, which requires a calculation from cardiac output, which can be challenging to measure in somebody who has overt RV failure. So we developed the pulmonary artery pulsatility index back in 2009 in our inferior MI population to identify who's having an RV MI and who's not. And this simple formula, basically, of PA pulse pressure and RA pressure is a ratio. And the reason we came up with this is this is what we were looking at every day on rounds when we were evaluating these patients who were on MCS. Do they have a return of PA pulsatility, and have we decongested or reduced uh, their RA pressure at all? And it turned out that the POPI score actually correlated very, very well with established metrics such as RA wedge pressure, RV stroke work, and echo scores of RV failure. So when we think about our algorithm at Tufts and how we manage these shock patients in the AMCS decision-making tree, it boils down to this very simple algorithm, which is a joke because it's not simple. It's complicated. And the reason uh, we actually have to have everyone uh, sign off on this, when we put this algorithm together two years ago, this was a series of meetings in a conference room with cardiac surgery intensivists. Perfusion was there, uh, the interventionalists on the heart failure team, primarily deciding does this algorithm make sense to us or not? And what we came up with was that if you are refractory to one inotrope or vasopressor in a patient with cardiogenic shock, the next step is to make sure that you're calling us, 
but also to get an echo and also to put in a PA catheter. And the echo, of course, is to rule out non-cardiac sources or look at pericardial disease. The PA catheter then defines whether or not you're indeed in cardiogenic shock, mixed picture, or non-cardiogenic shock. Once the cardiac index is determined to be less than 2.2, the question then becomes, what clinical scenario are we dealing with? For the patients who have severe aortic insufficiency, none of the devices that we talked about, for the most part, will handle that scenario. You can't put in a balloon pump. You can't put in Impella. You can't put in VA ECMO. And so this is where, actually, the tandem heart device uh, actually works effectively for patients with severe wide-open AI, and that's because it's reducing preload for a condition that's driven by pressure and volume overload. The, for patients who come in hypoxemic or persistent or recurrent refractory VT and VF, those are patients we put into the VA ECMO category, primarily because you can get circulatory support, you get that oxygenation sorted out, and in a majority of those cases, we're adding an LV vent so we get the LV unloaded and we're not getting lung injury um, from VA ECMO itself. For the remainder of patients who don't fall into those categories, we then stratify them by looking at that RA to wedge pressure interaction and putting them into the one of those hemodynamic profiles of shock. So if they come in with an elevated wedge pressure and a low RA pressure, then it's LV dominant, and we should be thinking about now LV support systems. Similarly, for RV, we then will look at the uh, elevated RA, low LA, and then the next layer we add on top of that is the poppy formula to say how bad is this RV dysfunction. A lot of patients will come in with a PA systolic pressure of 45, but may say their RV is failed by echo, but if your RV is generating a PA pressure of 45, no, it's pretty good. It's got some contractile reserve in there. You probably don't need an RV support system. So the poppy formula gets applied, and if the poppy is less than one, this patient will be looked at for RV support. And then for the patients who have bi-V congestion, this is where we again have to apply what is the next step. And these get a little bit more complicated, but we're still looking at the poppy to determine what's the role of the RV in this scenario. And should we be going on LV support first and then adding RV support if needed? Should we go on bi-V support? And if it's bi-V support, it's usually by Pella or it's VA ECMO with an LV vent. Tandem heart bivad starts to put us into a different arena um, where a number of folks are doing that across the country, but that's a lot of cannulas going in and out of arteries and veins. So the second message is you have to have an exit strategy. Before you put patients on these pumps, these pumps are very good for pushing blood around, but if you don't have an exit plan for these patients, then you're not going to have success with the program. And this is where you have to engage that multidisciplinary heart team discussion with cardiac surgery, advanced heart failure, critical care. It's also important to remember that shock is not just a unifying term. So if you come in with acute MI shock, this is a very different anatomic, physiologic, and pathophysiologic person or pathway than for patients who come in with advanced heart failure shock. So it really depends on your demographic. Are you seeing primarily STEMI in shock, or are you seeing mostly end-stage heart failure in shock, both of which require different, uh, different decision-making um, algorithms? So who do you want on your shock team? If it's your AMI shock patients, it's got to be your interventionalist who's primarily leading the charge. Cardiac surgery is the backup to determine whether or not this patient needs the OR. And then we add in the critical care intensivists or the advanced heart failure folks. If it's advanced heart failure shock, actually the person driving the ship is the advanced heart failure specialist. What is the exit strategy for this patient? Is there medical futility here? Do we need to actually, or can we bridge this patient successfully to transplant or to destination LVAD? And then the interventionalist comes second. Cardiac surgeons, I think, are also a critical part of that equation. But usually in advanced heart failure with the shock patients, Intermax 1, most cardiac surgeons are not necessarily getting involved in those cases unless it's to put in a temporary centromag or to put in VA ECMO and to basically play the role of an acute mechanical support specialist. So the reason for that, of course, is that outcomes for Intermax 1, which are the sickest patients with advanced heart failure, are worse if you're putting them on LVAD. So for Intermax 1 and 2 these days, it's not call your surgeon, it's usually call your interventionalist, can we stabilize the patient, and then determine are they a candidate for advanced therapies like transplant or LVAD. And we've seen this reflected in you know, for in the uh, uh, Intermax registry for some time, where bridge to recovery and rescue therapy utilization of LVADs has gone down considerably to far less than 1%. So this is a case that illustrates this point. This is a 70-year-old patient with chronic ischemic heart failure and reduced EF, Three weeks of shortness of breath, paroxysm of nocturnal dyspnea, non-revascularizable coronary anatomy, gets referred for advanced heart failure therapies. On arrival, patients got a blood pressure of 70 over 50. They're oxygenating at 92% on a face mask, summation gallop, murmurs, etc. The EF is 15%, LV is dilated, 
moderate MR, and moderate RV systolic dysfunction by echo. So the surgeons are involved at this point, as well as the advanced heart failure team. A swan goes in, and now you've got some data. So the right atrial pressure is 18, PA systolic pressure is 55, and the wedge pressure here is 20. Car fit cardiac index is 1.5 by PA sat of 41%. SVR is elevated, and the patient's, of course, hyponatremic with an elevated creatinine as well. So what to do with this type of patient? This person gets put on milrinone, a balloon pump gets put in, uh, and despite initially stabilizing, the patient remains hemodynamically unstable, and we're unable to wean off milrinone or a balloon pump. So 10 days later now, and that's 10 days later, uh, the patient's got an RA of 18, a wedge of 22, an index of 1.6, so PA's out of 43%. We haven't moved the dial very much. The sodium's come up a little bit, and the creatinine's come down just a little bit. So this is where we start to engage our palliative care teams, and we say, what's the next step for this patient? Is this even a DT option for this gentleman, and what's our next step? So our approach here is temporary mechanical support as a bridge to decision strategy to stabilize these hemodynamics and allow that conversation to occur before allowing this patient to continue to spiral in hemometabolic shock. So our platform for a lot of these patients has now become the Impella 5.0, which is an axillary cut down, a 10 millimeter graft uh, with a um, tunneled graft, and then through there an Impella 5.0 device is deployed. So we like the Impella 5.0 because it's a 22 French system. It's a large bore system, so the impeller blades are large enough. We do not see much hemolysis, if ever, with the Impella 5.0. And deployment through the axillary approach allows us to now get these patients up and about. So this patient now, for example, and this is a typical 5.0 patient, our physical therapists have gotten very into managing these patients. And so now these patients get into a rehab program immediately after the 5.0 goes in. So within day one, they're starting to exercise with PT. By day three, they're up and walking around the unit. And we've started to now quantify their mobility level. And it turns out their mobility level starts to become a major determinant of their outcomes. And so you can ambulate these patients, you can get them basically up to full body recovery and quantifying the ambulatory aspect I think is a critical next step for using these devices. So this patient then on day 14, four days after the device goes in, now has an RA of 8, wedge is 12, index is 2.2, 56 for the PA sat, more stabilized, and gets bridged to a hardware DT. This was an exceptional use for DT, although we had the recent approval, but this was an exception letter um, written by our team uh, for use of this device. So the use of the 5.0 as an axillary approach has really changed the way we think about uh, the Impella platform. We're now doing more and more percutaneous implant. This is a percutaneous axillary or brachial Impella CP, which is now becoming more and more of our standard approach for the Impella CPs. So it's a micropuncture in through the axillary or brachial. This is after ultrasound mapping of the artery. And then through here, a purse string is put in around the dilator. The device goes in uh, through this with just all percutaneous delivery. And then once we map out the artery itself, deliver the device in over a wire into the LV. Now we've got an axillary approach, patient can sit up and come out of the unit, uh, basically instead of lying flat um, while they're in cardiogenic shock. So message number three is don't ignore the right ventricle. So Impella versus ECMO for right ventricular support I think is a major question uh, that people are trying to figure out. So in this recent uh, review and circulation, we, div we divided these devices into two categories. One is direct RV bypass and the other is indirect RV bypass. The direct RV bypass systems take blood from the right atrium, put it into the pulmonary artery, and these include the RP as well as the tandem. An indirect bypass drains the right atrium and pressurizes the arterial system, so preventing blood from ever getting to the right ventricle. And when we look hemodynamically at the effects of these two approaches, you can see this in a patient where we had multiple transducers and cardiogenic shock. We activate VA ECMO and we get that nice circulatory support, but RA pressure and PA pressure both come down. And then as you can see, about 10 minutes later, this PA pressure in blue is starting to come back up. And part of the reason that why the PA pressure is coming back up, that's an early sign that you're starting to distend the LV. Because as the LVDP climbs, the LA pressure climbs, that's an amplifier for RV afterload. And the PA pressure may start to climb again, in which case now you're putting in some sort of vent mechanism on the left side. So this is another case, patient that came in, a 58-year-old gentleman with a prior ischemic cardiomyopathy, EF of 10% who has a normal RV on a recent outpatient echo, is non-revascularizable at this point. There's no coronary intervention required. Patient gets started on milrinone for heart failure, develops VF, gets a single defibrillation, is not intubated at this point. It's got a blood pressure of 80 over 60, not doing well clinically by exam. EF is now 5% on a bedside echo, and there's severe RV systolic dysfunction. So when we look at the hemodynamics on a balloon pump and milrinone, 
We've got an RA of 26 at this point, a wedge of 20, cardiac index of 1.4 again, creatinine of 1.8, and this is where we have to apply those RV metrics. So the RA wedge pressure is far above the 0 0.6 cutoff, and we're at 1.3, and the poppy is far less than 1.0, and both of these would indicate pretty profound RV dysfunction in this patient uh, who's 58 years old with an ischemic myopathy. So can you transition this patient to just an isolated LVAD? Do you need to go straight to biventricular centromags? Do you go on a VA ECMO for a patient who's not intubated, who's otherwise looking at you with an arterial set of 99%? Uh, and we also don't know this patient very well, so we don't know anything about this person who's just arrived to our hospital. So for this patient, we again would go on to a 5-0, and these are the Langston hemodynamics, LV and AO pressure, and the CVP is shown here at 24, coming into the hybrid room. The LV device gets activated, and what we see here is an interesting hemodynamic uh, signature. The LV pressure starts to decline precipitously. So just by activating the LV support system, we're seeing LV pressure come from about 60 all the way down to about 10. And at the same time, the arterial pressures come up, but most importantly, the CVP within a few minutes has gone from 24 to 28. And so now you're seeing that effect of activating a percutaneous LVAD on the left side and what it does to right ventricular venous return and congestion when the RV is not working. And so the next, the next step here is to start thinking about the use of a right-sided support system like the RP. So this is the device being implanted over a wire percutaneously from the femoral vein into the, um, into the PA position. So a few minutes later, while the RP has been set up in the room, CVP's gone to 34, your LV systolic pressure now is 5. And that's probably the lowest LV systolic pressure you'll see. And that's probably the largest LV AO gradient you'll see. But this is now becoming an indicator that you've evacuated all the blood from the left ventricle. There's no venous return to the left ventricle because uh, there's basically no RV function. And so you've put in a pump into a Ziploc bag and you've evacuated the bag. So now we put in the RV system and you can start to see here with the Langston that we're returning all that flow back into the LV. The LV is now generating that pulsatile waveform again. We've gone from a pulses paradoxes here because of profound RV failure with a decompressed LV to now just simply a flat mean arterial pressure, non-pulsatile unloaded tracing. And the CVP starts to come down within about 10 minutes to 22 again. So this type of uh, hemodynamic interrogation, I think, is where the cath lab can accelerate your decision making quite a bit. And that's because we can use tools like a SWAN, a Langston, to determine what's the next step. And we see this LV suction event that occurs over and over again in multiple patients who come in requiring biventricular support and cardiogenic shock. So this was this patient's configuration 24 hours after the bipella. we now got an RA of 12, wedge is 15, index is up, SAT's about 67%, and we're now starting to think, what can we bridge this patient to? And the main question for this 58-year-old was, can we get them to an isolated LV support system or not? And so preoperatively, the operator, the uh, surgeons love to see someone who's pink and peeing, and basically we're now seeing uh, this patient goes into the OR, gets a heart made too, the impella RP is left in place, primarily to allow the RV to have support as you're coming off pump. And so by leaving the RP in, it's in until postoperative day five, and then the RP comes out, and then you can just leave the patient on the, L, on the LVAD alone. So bridging those marginal RV cases through to just LVAD alone and letting them go home is an important use of the hemodynamic data as well as the use of these different support strategies. So we've been doing this more and more now in the cath lab for myocarditis or some of the shock patients. This is a myocarditis patient where we're on bi support, we support both ventricles, and we discharge to recovery um, without having to do any more uh, surgical cutdowns. It's all percutaneous. This analysis will be coming out, which is our Bipella uh, paper that's coming out, looking at 20 patients of Bipella. The main take-home messages here were that survivors tend to do better if you put both pumps in at the same time, so simultaneous, not staged implantation. And also, if you can get to the patients before they're on two pressors, that's when they tend to do better uh, than if you're waiting until they're on multiple pressors. This is another uh, paper coming out in JHLT, which looks at the Intermax 1 patients who got an Impella 5.0, and it turns out a major determinant of outcomes in these patients was moderate to severe RV dysfunction on echo. So the limitation of just having biventricular failure and univentricular support, the RV is always going to be an issue in this population. So the final message here is that when you're skating on thin ice, your safety is in speed. So that's where that AMCS program has to come into play. You've got to get to these patients before they're advancing past one inotrope. Once you're on two or three or four plus, your mortality starts to go through the roof. The lactates don't correlate as well. It's mostly the inotropic usage that we're seeing. We also know that with balloon pumps, we're still using balloon pumps. And in fact, in our population, despite the data that's come out, 
about 65% of patients are on a balloon pump prior to getting Impella or VA ECMO. And we're seeing less of that where our intensivists are now saying, you know what, can you go straight to a mechanical support system as opposed to going to balloon pump first? And that's, uh, that's I think, is helping with our outcomes. So a final case that I'll show you uh, is this is an 80-year-old gentleman who came in. And this was a patient who came in with ACS and STEMI, pain-free, EF 35%, normal RV. They've got a 90% left main, 100% RCA. It's a pretty straightforward cabbage case. The patient's hemodynamically stable. But while awaiting cabbage, the patient develops cardiac arrest, 20 minutes uh, till they get ROSC. And this is now an 80-year-old gentleman with in-hospital arrest, multivessel disease. It's now 2 in the morning, so there's nobody in the hospital. The patient gets a balloon pump put in by the interventional team overnight, and the hemodynamic signature shows very nice diastolic augmentation with the balloon pump. And that's a very reassuring finding. The problem is that a swan didn't go in at the same time. And so six hours later, with the balloon pump and this beautiful diastolic augmentation tracing, they've got escalating inotropes. They're now on three pressors in an 80-year-old who's got a balloon pump and cardiogenic shock. We come in in the morning, and our first intervention is to put in a swan. The RA is 22. The wedge is 24. Poppy is 0.5. And the PA sat is 24% in this patient. And the problem with that is that when we see this diastolic augmentation on balloon pump tracing, we're often very reassured because we think the pump's doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing. And the main take home is that diastolic augmentation does not equate to augmented cardiac index. So you have to have that swan in place to make sure your pump is doing what it's supposed to be doing and achieving the goal that you want it to achieve, which in this case is not just blood pressure, it's getting more cardiac output. So the patient comes to the cath lab emergently now at this point. A CP gets put in, a RP gets put in. We end up now with this hemodynamic configuration where there's non-pulsatile flow, stabilized mean arterial pressure. PA sat's beginning to come up now. We're at 44%. Arterial sat stays at 98. If the arterial sat was low, we would have done VA ECMO for this patient on the algorithm. And what we're seeing now is we can do a PCI. And so a simple bifurcation left main, which many people say that's amazing. And you'll see tons of this at TCT and SCAI and a lot of uh, tweets and WhatsApp things all showing these types of crazy configurations. But for us on the AMCS team, the problem is the patient died. And that's because we ignored the door to support time. By the time we got to this patient, six hours had gone by, escalating pressors and inotropes. A balloon pump was the intervention, which is insufficient. And there was no hemodynamic data to guide decision making. So for us, this was actually a major failure of the AMCS team. And we had multiple meetings about how to avoid this in the future uh, for these types of patients who are otherwise coming in um, pretty stable and STEMI. So we're seeing an evolution in the field. We're seeing that for the cardiogenic shock arena, medical therapy in 1999 was the major shock trial for early revascularization. This now is coming up to the door to support initiative. And there's a new initiative in New England called the New England Cardiogenic Shock Initiative to develop a prospective registry, which is designed to look at STEMI shock patients. And we're uh, having a meeting on October 12th, which I've informed your team about, to start to launch a New England consortium for a prospective data collection on STEMI shock and early use of AMCS. We also know from the AMI world that we're starting to get to a point of early unloading. We talked about the myocardial and oxygen consumption aspects of uh, mechanical support. And the question is, can we start to change the direction for STEMI patients who come in uh, and need uh, mechanical support? So what we're seeing now is a change in the field. We've talked about 2007 to 2017. We talked a lot about the devices that are focused on cardiac replacement which are surgical durable LVADs. We're now seeing a lot of these smaller pumps come out, which are now really focused on bridging patients to cardiac recovery as opposed to mandating replacement. And I think you'll start to see even more of this type of engineering push in this direction over time. So I'm going to skip over a series of slides here to bring you to the ultimate point. This was a lot of basic science work, which will take way too much time. But essentially, we've now launched the door-to-unload safety and feasibility study. Um, so you should be aware of this trial. It's for STEMI patients very much like the CRISP-AMI trial for anterior STEMIs not in shock, trying to get them on mechanical support, with the postulate being that if you can reduce oxygen consumption, that you can actually stabilize and reduce infarct size for these patients. So the safety feasibility studies launched. It's 50 patients that we're looking at at about 15 centers across the U.S. where we take these patients, put them on a pump, and then open the artery uh, before, um, uh, before we have them leave the cath lab. So one of the things that you're hearing more and more is this theme of interventional and heart failure developing crosstalk. So we talked a little bit about this at dinner last night. So one is to have an acute MCS team that focuses on mechanical support, decision-making clinically. 
This working group that we've developed at Tufts also does a lot of the introspective data analysis internally from our own experience because that's where we're going to learn how to make ourselves better. And in this, we've also started to combine our interventionalist and our heart failure training programs. So fellows are now coming out dual train in advanced heart failure transplant and in interventional so that when you're in the cath lab having a conversation with the interventionalist, they're fully aware of Intermax 1, LVAD, BIVAD, Centromag, et cetera. And that's becoming more and more a part of what we do, especially around MCS. And we've had nine alumni from the IHF program uh, who are now out there dual certified um, in both interventional and heart failure. So it takes a lot of teams to get a lot of this work done. We skipped all over a lot of the basic science, which is where the R1s are funded from. But I think it's important to be aware of the fact that there's a lot of evolution in the field. If you want to learn more about MCS and hemodynamics, I would recommend checking out the TEACH program, which is coming from Dan Burkoff and CRF. Primarily, it's an online platform for pressure volume loops, and you can implant all the devices and learn about how they work. The CHIP program you've heard about, which is hemodynamic support and complex PCI. There's also another group that's called the ACURE group, which is acute cardiac unloading and recovery. And the meeting next year um, will hopefully be in the United States. Uh, this year was in the, around ESC. And this focus is for fellows to submit abstracts, for faculty also to present their work on mechanical unloading. And then finally, there's also the DHF meeting, which is held every year in Europe. This year it's in Berlin. And this is two days of all devices uh, for heart failure. And that goes from intraarterial arterial shunts to mechanical valves, as well as to MCS. So with that, thanks very much for your attention. <laughs>